You know, let, let me just share something before I start the sermon. Um, I was not real encouraged to come to church this morning. How many of you were just knocking it to get here today? He was ready to come. All right? I was not ready to come. You were not ready to come. You were thinking, any minute I'm going to get a text, Don's going to cancel, right? No, I was thinking, I really don't want to go to church today. All right, good. All right. All right. S -s Some authenticity. All right. Is it okay if the preacher feels the same way? Absolutely. All right. All right. Because you know what I thought I was going to find? was I thought I was going to find a, a small group of people that didn't want to be here because they're going, it's cold outside. And I found out that was just me. <laughs> All right. Nobody else was feeling that way. And it's like, you know, in, in church planning, the, the lesson is over and over. When you expect God to do something, he usually says, I'm in charge, not you. I'll, I'll do it when I want to do it. And when you least expect him to do something, he surprises you. And and today, I mean, so so far, I'm, it's not going to stop. I, I'm just really glad I'm here today. I'm glad that it didn't snow so much that we had to cancel and the roads were good. So, all right, let's go. Well, we come to the end of our uh, series today entitled Stand. And we've learned that uh, from the experience of Daniel and his friends that when we, we stand with God and that we... Um, we open doors for God to do things in our lives and to reveal His love, reveal His glory, His power. And we often, I think, limit God by our fear, also by our, excuse me, desire to have other people, uh, their, their opinions of us. And, um, and this has been, for me, it's been a good series. But to, today we come to the end of the story of Daniel. And the year is about 536 B.C., if that means anything to you. It's the third year after um, this great Persian king, Cyrus, has, has conquered Babylon, where the Israelites have been taken, or the people of Judah, technically, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And, it, you know, for a season, it, it looks at this time like this great Persian Babylonian conflict, because the Persian Mead Empire is a huge empire, and it looks like they have this war. And this is kind of the war to end all wars. And I, I don't know, I, th this period of history I, I'm not real skilled on, but it's, uh, the, the Persian Empire is a, was a huge empire. And it seems like there's this new era of peace that's spreading. Okay, so the Persians have come in and conquered the Babylonians. That's three years ago. And at this time, the Jews that were taken into captivity have already returned. They're, they're back in Jerusalem. They're starting to build the temple again. And uh, they're returning. And, and where we're going to pick up here is in Daniel 10. Uh, again, we're, we're going to read the whole thing today. We're going to go through the whole um, book of Daniel 10. But if you want to look at that if, if on your phone or on, on the Pew Bible. So, so here we go with Daniel 10, verses 1 to 2. In the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar, and the message was true and one of great conflict. But he understood the message, and he had an understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were completed. Daniel's an old man now, and he's, he's seen just in recent days so much bloodshed, this, you know, this, so much heartache you know, going on. But he still he has this vision about the wars that are to come, and, and that's in the subsequent chapters to this in 11 and 12. And, and Daniel's extremely upset. And I think here's some insight for us just, just right off, that Daniel sees the future, and it's not good. And, and some people are just, uh, you know, almost consumed with knowing what's going to happen in the future. They want to know exactly what's going to happen. So, so they'll go and, you know, um, they, they want to know not just about world governments, but it's personal. They want to know, him. is this relationship with this, this guy, is this going to flourish? Is this going to go anywhere? Or they want to know if they'll, they'll get a better job. And, 
it's it's more than than curiosity and often it just almost becomes an obsession that they just you know will uh, they'll have their cards read or they'll they'll pay somebody some psychic to try to tell them what's going to happen others become obsessed with knowing exact specifics a Bible prophecy, and I know we have, you know, I, I don't want to call that out, but but we've all seen this where people, well, who's the Antichrist, and you know, is is the black president, is he the Antichrist, or is this Pope the Antichrist, and and all this stuff is they they try to figure out the specifics of Bible prophecy, and okay, somebody dropped out of the European alliance, is that the sign of the end? And I mean, well, here's the question. What if you really were allowed to know the future? What if you knew specifically what was going to happen? Because Daniel does. And he sees this mess. He knows what's going to happen. And he's a godly man. He doesn't have self-interest. And yet it just tears him up. When God shows him what's going to happen, Daniel goes into this extreme period of mourning. Now, at the same time that this goes on, uh, the prophet Isaiah was writing, um, and the latter part of Isaiah is written at this time. In Isaiah 55, uh, verses 6, and then I skipped a couple, uh, 8 to 9, he, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. We've all heard that passage of Scripture. And it, it, sometimes it's kind of used to, to, you know, explain something that's kind of enigmatic about Scripture that we can't understand. So God's highest thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But, you know, here he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. Why? Because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I want to tell you those thoughts. I want to tell you my ways. And Daniel sees in the future, and he goes to God for understanding. And he, he begins this 21-day fast. No meat, no sweets, no wine, no bathing. Did you catch that part? No lotions? That means no bathing in their, their area. I mean, he's serious about this. This guy is downright serious. I mean, he's, he's not just getting up, giving up chocolate after dinner. He's going all the way. And he's been shown something that's so disturbing to him that he invents what's now been called the Daniel Fast. I think Rick Warren wrote a book about this and is making a lot of money on, on the Daniel Fast. Very popular uh, kind of dietary purge is what most people look at this as. And, you know, you're going to clean your body up. And that's not why Daniel does this at all. He sees the future, chapters 11 and 12 that follow this, and it's a bloody future for the world. A nation is against nation. And after what he's just gone through with this war, this is not good news. See, he sees the future. And the Persians, he saw the Persians' con conquest of Babylon. And then what's next is the Greek Empire comes in and conquers the Persian Empire. And so he seeks God. He doesn't consult the magicians. He doesn't consult the sorcerers. He begins to fast so that he might see... He, you know, he fasts so that he might seek God, so that he might understand and see what God is really doing. And, and fasting is, is not, you know, as we come to Lent, fasting is not just a diet. It's not a diet that makes us look good for our, you know, um, class reunion that's coming up or something. Fasting is, is not twisting God's arm to get him to do what you want him to do. You know, I'm going to fast and then I'll, I'll get this from him. Fasting is, is seeking God with our whole person. You see, it's, it's redirecting our desires, just like what we were talking about here with Tim, from food to God. It's, 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 it's using, overcoming these desires that we're taking as someplace else, now redirecting these desires toward God. And the result of his fast and prayer is a response from God that I don't think we can anticipate. Let's read on. Daniel 10, 4-10. to 10. On the 24th day of the first month while I was back, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Ephaz. His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sounds of a tumult." 
Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, the great dread fell upon them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was alone, I was left alone, and saw the great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. See, some weird stuff. I mean, that's not what we expect to see. But... What, what would you tell a friend if they had a vision? I was thinking about this. You know, a friend comes to you and they say, this is what I saw and it's something like this. I mean, what do you do with that? You go, well, that's nice. That's, 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 that's real neat. I'm real, I'm real happy for you. Gee, wow. You're really under a lot of stress, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You've been fasting for a while, haven't you? Have you been... Yeah, not taking much protein in. You know, you need some protein. I mean, how about a Snickers bar? That's what we would do today. You need a Snickers. You're not yourself. Really? A friend tells you, God told me this. And then they say something that sounds rather strange, like, um, God told me to build a boat because he's going to flood the earth. You go, oh, really? Really, Noah? Huh, that's nice. Or... Take your wife and your daughters and flee from this city because this city happens to be going to be destroyed. It's, you know, it's on a, a great fault and there's a volcano that's going to come up. And really a lot, you know. Um, my fiance's um, pregnant and it's God's son. Really, Joseph, isn't that? <laughs> that's nice. Isn't that, that's, that's interesting, yeah. You realize the great visions that people have, and, and they are given to some people at times, and that the great visions that they have, great words of revelation are not accepted by many people. There's always somebody that confirms it, that says, yes, you've heard from God, but they're always rejected. There, there's going to be a few that confirm. Almost anyone else will not see what you see or hear what you hear. And why is that? Well, Probably because they're not fasting for 21 days like you are fasting. They're not really listening like you're listening. In short, they may not really want to hear. They may not really want to see what you're seeing or hearing. They, they may go hide because, because it's, it's a scary thing to hear something from God. It's really frightening. But we're promised that we will, that if we seek, that we will find. That's what God says over and over in Scripture. The verse that comes to mind immediately for me that you know is Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Another prophet that's confirming to people that have been through a disciplined time that if you really listen, if you really want to hear me, you will hear me. Jesus said something similar. Remember he said, ask and it will be given to you. Uh, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you because everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened, Matthew 7. Everyone, not just, you know, the perfect ones, not just the pious ones, no qualifiers here, just the seekers. If you're saying, I want to hear, God will speak to you because God wants us to hear. God speaks to us. God wants to open up to us uh, truth and reality. And I, I, I re encourage you, regardless of your, your state of piety or your uh, state of uh, purity or your experience or your theology, left or right, this has nothing to do with that, to ask God to speak to you. I was thinking about this. You know, um, it, it's, it's not... When I was a little kid, the, the person that was always held up uh, in most of the churches, not all the churches was Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer was a man who was, whew, at age 30, he, was, he had become a, a professor in seminary, uh, had written some very pivotal books at age 30. Since Jesus was 30 when he went to his ministry, Albert Schweitzer decided that he would give all of that up, go to medical school, and he heard a clear call from God telling him to do this, and then he was going to give the rest of his life 
60 years, in fact, by going to Africa and setting up hospitals in Africa. And Albert Schweitzer was held up for many of us to be kind of the Mother Teresa type person. You don't hear of Albert Schweitzer anymore. But he left the life that he had at age 30, went three years to medical school to be trained as a doctor. Oh, by the way, he was a concert organist too. <laughs> World-renowned concert organist. And left all of that to go into the depths of Africa and sacrifice. You talk about a call of God on his life. We don't talk about him much anymore. So, our asking is from God to speak to us probably isn't about, you know, some great world thing that's going to happen. It's more likely about a, a relationship issue, a, a problem at work, some kind of tension that's going on in our life. But nevertheless, God wants to answer. So, Daniel sees this man in a white linen and a gold belt and a body that's glowing and his face is like lightning and his eyes are like flames. And Daniel's strength, it says, goes out of him. Well, wouldn't it go out of all of us? And then the man speaks and it sounds like he's speaking. A tumult means that he's kind of, it's kind of like thunder underwater. You know, it's just strange. Not really, you know, an odd thing. And it's shocking and it's obviously the barrier Obviously, the barrier between heaven and earth has been opened up for, for Daniel. Let's go on. Daniel 10, 10 to 14. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for twenty-one days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. Now, this, this heavenly being, this vision, tells Daniel that God sent him immediately, 21 days ago when he first started praying, but he could not give Daniel the message that God wanted him to have because of the prince of Persia had prevented him until Michael the angel came and helped. Now, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I understand the what or the how of this. I, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people have ideas. Some are very certain about them. I am less than certain about what this, but I, you know, what or who um, exactly is the Prince of Persia? What are the powers? What are his limitations? I really don't think that's important because that is not under my management and, and the, the truth of the Bible does not hinge or rest upon this point. Okay, But later Daniel will reference the prince of Greece will come, which is the next empire that defeats Persia. And it seems to me that what is being said is that behind the world systems, behind the nation's especially some nations and empires, that evil fights against the plan of God. I, th I think we can say that here with much certainty, without knowing the, the exact nature of this prince of Persia. And I think the prince of Persia here stands for the power of domination and war and hate and all, uh, you know, and, and its fight against all that's good in the kingdom that has no end. And what we know is that prayer is what engages this world. See, Daniel prays, and he's engaged in this world, battling against, as Paul would say in Ephesians, of the world forces of darkness. Okay. And he says, stand against them, Paul does. 
And that, that was what Daniel was doing. It clearly shows what I would call a spiritual worldview. Not to just look at this world as to be everything that humans do, but behind everything, that there is another power, a good power, and that there is an opposing power against this. And, and really, if you say, that's a little too weird for me, Don, you need to study world history a little bit and, and look at some terrible things that have been done as well as some very good things that have been done. You see, God is in control, but God is also opposed. And so we know that God always is doing more than what we know is, being, is going on. Daniel started praying the first day, and he didn't know anything was happening for 21 days. God is always doing more than what we know, even about our personal prayers. Daniel prayed for 21 days, and it took a while. God always is doing more than what we can what we can see and understand. And, and we've had the experience, Nun and I have many times, um, where we will be, um, just one example, we will be moved and, and feel together that we are supposed to give something to someone. And, and there were days, uh, this isn't the case now, I'll be honest with you, but there were days in the past when uh, we giving something to someone meant that we did without something. But God would say, I want you to give this away. I want you to give this to someone. I want you to give this amount of money to somebody or give this object to somebody. And things were tight. Things were really tight financially. And we had the experience so many times that we would give something away. And then within just a few days, there would be a gift that would come in the mail or be given to us personally that was predated before us even deciding to give the gift. And it was obvious that God was replenishing our bank account and God had decided to do this, set those forces in motion before we ever even decided to do it. The foreknowledge of God is sometimes just amazing. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know, we, we give $20 to somebody and then we get a, a check in the mail from an insurance rebate for $20 and it was sent before we ever made the decision. And you go, wow, God is always doing something so much more than what I know. But look at, look at verse 11 here. Oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright and I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken the word to me, I stood up trembling. The messenger tells Daniel that he's held in high esteem. Some other translations say greatly loved. I like that better. That Daniel is overcome by this message of evil in the world. And then God says to him, stand up. I really love you. Stand up, Daniel. I really love you. I mean, can you receive that today? Can we receive that today that God says to us, you know, stand up because I really love you. You are highly esteemed. Because God loves you, God loves us more than what we can know. In the same way that God is always doing more than what we know, God loves us more than what we can know. It's a love of God that leads us to seek to change. Remember the, the word of Paul to, to Romans there in Romans 2, 4, it says the kindness of God leads us to repentance. It's not the terror of God. It's not the punishment of God. But it's the love of God that leads us to change. You are greatly loved. We don't stand before God because we're perfect or pious or spiritual or even because we've been fasting for 21 days. We stand in the presence of God because God has chosen to love us. And he sends messengers to us all the time to tell us that good news. We continue on. Daniel 10, 15 to 21. And when he had spoken to me according to these words... I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just... Just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. He said, O oh man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. That's shalom. Take courage be, and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, 
May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia, so I am going forth. Behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is described in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against those forces except Michael, your prince. Well, let's go back and just, just, just look, look at verse 18 just a minute here. He says, Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. Two times the messenger touches him. Two times he strengthens him. God sends this messenger to strengthen Daniel. He tells Daniel, you're loved. And he says, peace to you, shalom to you, wellness to you. And he touches him and he strengthens him. Then he says, do you understand why I came? 21 days of fasting, 21 days of prayer, and I've come to strengthen you. All that way, all that fight to give Daniel strength. There's times when we think we can't go on. When we think I'm done. I just want to quit. There's, there's times when we say, this is it. I, I, I'm over. I don't want to talk to them anymore. I, I, I don't care what the kids want. I'm done. I, I don't care who calls. I've had it with this problem. You've been there, haven't you? You said, I just, I'm at my end. This is it. I'm at my end. I just can't go on. I'm done. And as we do that, as we get to that point, we think, man, I, I'm letting God down terribly today. I, I'm just really letting him down. And we'll tell you, no, you're not. God knows where your strength is. God knows that you're not letting him down. Because often we have to get to this point of I have no strength left in this particular problem before we will really let God. That kind of sounds like a refrigerator thing. I mean, the verse that we are saying we'd put up on a refrigerator. Maybe one of those little things with the cat hanging, you know, right? Need a little levity in here, right? One of those pictures of the cat hanging. I just hang on there. You know, put that on the refrigerator for a while. But we do. Sometimes we have to get to the point where we think, I just can't do this anymore before we will really be open to change, to letting God and listening to God I remember in my younger days when I used to lift weights three or four times uh, a, a week, and usually I would have a buddy at the gym. Uh, usually it wasn't a close friend, just some guy you worked out with. And we would spot each other. Those of you that work out know what a spotter is, right? He's a guy that stands with you, and and uh, he just turns into just a meanie uh, while he's standing with you. and. And uh, you get done with your reps, and he goes, okay, three more. And you I can't do three more. And he goes, you worm, you can do three more. Come on, you big sissy. And he stands over you, and, you know, in case you're going you're gonna to drop the, the 450 pounds that I'm bench pressing right, on my chest, well, he will, he will step in there and grab the bar so I don't hurt myself, right? But it's, it's more than that. I mean, there you are, and he says three more, and you... You do the first one and, you know, you just can barely get it up and you start in the second one and you're spitting and you're puffing and, you know, like blowing artery over here and it's, you know, bleeding out all over the place. And there's this guy and he goes, come on, come on, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. You know, just two more, one more. And the last one, you sh you're just sure you're, you're going to die, but you can't stop because your spotter is there. And somehow... You two get the thing up and you get it back on the rack. And what does he say to you? He said, man, that was all you. I wasn't doing any of it. That was all you. And you go, yeah, you big liar. The last one, I didn't do anything, you know. Those last three reps, though, those last three times when you got to the end, they tell us that's where the muscle's made. When you're tearing out the old muscle, that's where you're building the new muscle. And, and unless you're willing to get to, to have that spotter that's going to push you, you you're never really going to go very much in weightlifting. And so often we pray and we ask and we work and we study and we wait and we wait and it just doesn't get any better. You know what I mean? You say, how long is this going to go on? It's just not getting any better. And we get so tired and we want to give up and we say, I've had it, I can't do any more. And it's just about that point that we think, I can't do another rep, okay, 
that we're open to a spotter putting his hands on our bar and taking some of the weight from us. But up until that point, we were going to lift it all on our own. We do it with God. He strengthens us. I don't know if you've been there. If, if you've been there before, then you know that I'm talking is true. If you haven't been there, you'll be there. You'll, you'll get there sometime where you think, I just want to quit. I, I, I don't want to go on. I don't have any strength left in me. I have no resources left at all. And when you're there, keep your eyes and your ears open because that's when God's going to send you that messenger. And he's going to come alongside of you, God himself. And he's going to touch you. And he's going to say, I traveled all this way just to strengthen you. Because you see, I love you greatly. Because God wants to speak to us. He's always doing more than what we know. And God does want to strengthen us. Amen. Good good ending to Daniel, isn't it? Let's, let's have a prayer. As deep cries out